welcome to Women Rise, Women at the Frontline. My name is Naiga Madrin and uh, welcome to the new year 2024. Yes, you can tell us how the new year is treating you so far in our comment section. And uh, you can follow all our conversations on uh, all our social media platforms on Twitter, Facebook, uh, TikTok, Instagram and of course here on YouTube. We are always here every Saturday at 3 p.m. Yes, to get these exciting and uh, entertaining stories from our guests. Now, as the new year begin, we fast things fast. We need to, to do a lot more with our environment. And uh, with me, I have a guest who is going to talk more about this. And uh, yes, we are really privileged to have you, Sarah. Thank you for coming to Women at the Frontline. Thank you so much. For and uh, we are looking forward to sharing more with you and hearing more from you uh, with what you're doing as an environmentalist. Yes, so Sarah, I'll give you an opportunity. Say hello to our viewers, introduce yourself, and uh, tell us what you're doing. All right, thank you so much, Madrin. Oh, okay. um, my name is Kori Sarah Chabjura. I am a climate justice activist from Uganda. I'm also the, uh, the founder of Climate Change Action Africa, which is uh, an initiative that's raising awareness about climate change in schools. Mm -hmm. We have about 15 secondary wow. schools that have climate action clubs. Okay. So we believe that within these schools, we can empower students to innovate, mm -hmm. not only like to understand the climate crisis, but also to like start innovating local solutions to the climate crisis. Yes. And yeah, I'm also a co-founder of an initiative called the Solar Radiation Modification Youth Watch, mm. which I think I'll be sharing with you during the interview today. Yes. Yeah, so I'm just an environmentalist who is very passionate about the environment and really cares about what happens to planet Earth, you know, yeah. in the next few years. And then you mentioned passionate about the environment. So tell us, who inspires you? What inspires you to join this advocacy work? And uh, tell us more about what you're doing. All right, thank you. So um, I started, I think, I started this while I was in high school. Okay. Uh, I was in Avicenza Girls School for a level. Yeah. And so there was, um, there was an essay competition by uh, the Ministry of Water and Environment. Mm. And uh, that time it, at, at that time, it was about, um, about climate change. Mm. So it was a series of essay competitions. Okay. So at the time, I was doing essay writing a lot. Um, being a literature student at the yeah. time, ah. I was so interested in essay writing. Mm. And I remember I participated in the essay competitions and that really exposed me to the extremes of like the climate crisis. Because I had this, I read these articles while I was trying to like come build on a, an essay. Mm. And to me, I felt I came to a realization that this is such a big issue yeah. at a global level. Yeah. And that in a way sparked of my advocacy journey. Because at the time, I um, collaborated with another friend of ours. Mm. And you know, when we were writing the essays, we, uh, there was an essay on um, how young people can um, solve the problem of climate change. And I remember when I was writing the essay, I was like looking at like, what are the solutions? And one of the things that really caught my, my, my eye at the time was um, the awareness rising, capacity building and awareness rising for young people. Because mm. to me, I felt like that was something I could do. And at least that was something I could contribute. And that is where I would start, at least from that school yeah. setting. Mm. So we started with a colleague. I collaborated with a colleague of mine who was doing writing of books on climate change. And we started the Climate Action Club in Navisunsa. Okay. And um, also at the time, I was elected as a student council president. And I was serving at Onsa Kampala. Mm -hmm. And I was collaborating with also other leaders from within Kampala. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, this is a very nice thing to take to other schools. And then we collaborated and we now have the 15 schools that have the Climate wow. Action Clubs. Now that's that's yeah. a good thing. And uh, I hope you're, you're doing more, you're still doing more to also reach out in uh, various schools in yeah. Uganda. Yeah, we are. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you mentioned you're the founder of the Climate Change Action climate change action africa take us through the areas of focus and what you're basically doing yeah so with the climate action africa this is the initiative now that i'm telling you about schools um the climate action africa is really focused on schools um secondary schools in uganda mm -hmm. uh through the climate action club so what we do we decided we're like well we have this climate action um 
clubs within schools. What is the unifying factor? What brings these schools together? So that's how we came up with the initiative of Climate Action Africa with the vision of we want to expand to other African countries and reach other secondary school students from across Africa. So the idea of Climate Change Action Africa is to raise awareness because mm. young people need to understand what the climate crisis is, even for them to think about what they can do or how they can contribute to the problem. Yeah. So we started that, um, the, yeah, we started the Climate Action Africa and it's mainly to raise awareness, but also not only to raise awareness, but also to empower young people. Because I mean, like if you know a problem, for example, and you're not empowered to solve yeah. a problem, you just yeah. know a problem and it's too heavy on you. Mm. And, we need to empower you to be able to solve that problem. And so that's the idea that we uh, came up with. And we're like, well, let's empower these young people to be able to like innovate solutions, local solutions yeah, to climate problems yeah, within uh, the region. So yeah, the idea is to raise awareness and just basically to and, uh, empower young people. You mentioned about local solutions. What are some of the solutions that you have really initiated for yeah. us to adapt? Yeah. So um, when we started, I told you, we were basically looking at innovation yeah. at, the, at the same time, awareness rising. So one of the things that I'm really proud about, like Climate Change Action Africa, uh, it's because it has led to the birth of Ecosense Cities Uganda. Mm. So this is like a waste management company that is currently operational in Lira. Okay. So we had, when I moved to university after I left secondary school, I was like, how can I push this initiative to the university yeah. level? Mm. So I started a chapter of that within the university that I was in okay. Lira. And so while I was there, um, we, we, we came up with an idea, well, why can't we think of, why can't we solve, like, because at the time there was a problem of waste management within Lira. Mm. I wasn't at spearheading it as such, but people that were within the initiative, the Climate Change Action Africa University chapter came up with the idea of Ecosense Cities Uganda and that led to a waste management company that is currently operational in Lira. Oh. Yeah. So mm. that is the power of innovation. You know, that is the mm. power and that is what we were really looking at when we started the initiative. We wanted to empower these young people to come up with solutions. So to me that is a perfect example of what young people can do if they are empowered. Mm. Yeah. And then you're, you're talking more of young people, young people. How is the progress so far? <laughs> With young people? And are young people being are receiving this? Yeah, you, I, could, I could tell you that um, when it comes to the climate crisis, for example, young people are, getting, are becoming aware of the crisis, of the problem, right? So as to regards to whether young people um, are aware, because, I mean, we are the, the future generation. We are the ones that are going to inherit mm. uh, this earth. And in like 10, five years from now, we are the ones to deal with the problems yeah. if we do not really. So it's very important, and that's the thing, it's very important to bring young people to the discussion mm. and to like, like let them be part of the discussion and like let them be involved in like finding solutions to the problem. Yeah. So I think that's the reason why I'm very also very passionate with like mm. young, like working with young people. Okay. And uh, you're a co-founder of the Solar Radiation Modification Youth Watch. How does this work? And uh, how young people, how do, should young people all, how, young, how will young people be involved in this? How, what can they do to see that we have environmental sustainability? Yeah, so just to put something uh, very clearly, when I started the Climate Action Africa, I started the Climate Action Africa when I was in school, and then I went to the university, started the same a chapter at the yes. university, mm. and when uh, at the time uh, there was, uh, I, I was selected as one of the young people to participate in a global project, right? And they did that because of the work that I was doing Which within my schools, doing, like yeah. the info, the, the the amount of uh, work that we're doing within secondary. I had a reach to young people. So the project was under Carnegie Council, that is the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative. Mm. It's a New York based organization that basically there was, uh, it, it was bringing the discussion of the new climate altering technologies. So they felt like they needed to empower young people to uh, take part in the conversation because this is something that is going to greatly affect us in the near future. Mm. So that is how I got to be part of the project. Uh, the, 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 it was just it is a it was a project that was aiming specifically at raising at building our capacity yeah. to engage with these technologies. There are certain technologies that are being developed to solve 
the climate crisis, crisis. The, yeah the climate crisis at a global level okay. but most of which pose very serious risks to the whole of humanity because this is like man's attempt to artificially control the world's climate like uh, that there are research projects that are being conducted that are really extreme and they can affect everybody on earth mm -hmm. so they're like this is something that is going to affect everybody on earth why aren't we involving young people and not only involving young people in the global north but young people in the global south yeah. us in africa and in asia mm -hmm. so really from the work that i was having in schools uh they felt like i was really in a better position to really engage these young people and so I participated in the project for a whole year. Okay. We're learning about the technologies. What are they? What is the status of these technologies? Mm -hmm. How is it going to affect us? Mm -hmm. What do we need to do? And then I've been translating that information now to young people all across the country. Wow. Yeah. And uh, maybe before we go so much deep into the conversation, mm -hmm. we, you should have told us the status of the climate <laughs> in, in Uganda particularly. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So I could tell you from a global perspective, uh, globally, uh, you know, there is a body that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that is a body that gives information about the climate crisis, right? Mm. And so scientific information about the climate. So they are the ones that uh, provide information from which we make decisions, right? So in that recent report that came out in 2022, uh, 2020, yeah, 2022, they, it's the six assessment report, mm -hmm. they, said, they stated that we are more likely than not to hit 1.5 degrees Celsius in the near term, that is in 20, 2040 to 2050. Mm -hmm. the, what this means is that even if the world decides that we want to cut our emissions so fast and very rapidly, yeah, we are still going to hit 1.5 degrees Celsius. And I can tell you, Right now we're about 1.2 degrees Celsius, but the impacts mm. of climate change are too severe. Yeah. And so there's a whole notion of at 1.5 degrees, like that would be a, a death sentence to several communities, communities like those in Africa. For example, in Africa, we have hotspots areas that are suffering more yeah. the impacts of climate. Look at, for example, Karamoja. Mm. Uh, you can see that in Karamoja, like people are really suffering, like that is that really at the very front line of the climate crisis. So when you talk about 1.5 degrees Celsius um, increase by 2050, that is so near, you know, yeah. and, and that is very scary. And the fact that uh, even if we cut our emissions very rapidly, um, we will still hit that. It's very scary for us. Mm. And so I think that's the reason why conversations like what can we do? to help ourselves, yeah. to protect ourselves, or to reduce the impacts of climate change when we hit that point. That situation is called the situation of overshoot. Mm. So when we hit 1.5, what can we do to adapt to protect our communities? And that's why the discussion of these technologies are coming in. Oh, yeah. wow, we shall be so grateful. To... <laughs> and uh, do you think you, as Ugandans, we are doing enough? Are we having enough conversations about this? Uh, yeah, I think because um, in the country, I actually last year, I was very privileged to uh, be one of the young people that was drafting the youth position paper for COP28. Ah. And specifically, I was leading the thematic area of technology. Mm. And I could tell you that all across Uganda, the discussion has picked up, you know. Mm. For example, towards COP, we had several workshops, several yeah. trainings. And I could tell you one of the things that the government is doing is really train young people. Like, for example, I attended a capacity building program for young people mm. and a ministry of water and environment. They're training young climate negotiators. So that's powerful. The, the, yeah. the, 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 the conversation has really, really picked up. In the, and that's, to me, I think that is very powerful, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And then tell us more about the COP you attended, you as a young activist, yeah. what do you think we yeah. should do? Yes. Or you can also give us some of your perspectives, what, what came out from the conference. Yeah. So with COP28, I can tell you that with COP28, we had a lot of preparations before okay. COP. So there was this whole training sessions for young negotiators and then there was us now coming together with support of UNDP to develop the youth position paper for COP28 and so while going to COP28 I had so much hope you know mm -hmm. as a young person I was like I know that something is going to come out of this COP but also why um, but also that was you know if you looked at other people's views most people thought this COP should really come out with something tangible for the whole world in terms of uh, climate change and in terms of um, reduction of fossil fuels. Mm. So 
went to COP, of course, and particularly I was very involved with organizing side events for young people. For example, I told you I was working on that technological, uh, the new climate altering technologies. We organized a side event um, with other young people from all around the world to raise awareness about these technologies. But one of the key outcomes for me from COP was uh, the discussion around fossil fuels. Okay. So there was this whole discussion of whether we should phase out fossil fuels or phase down fossil fuels. And it was such a heated conversation during COP28. But one of the things that I really think that COP brought out for people around the world is that the discussion on uh, transitioning away from fossil fuels. Okay. At least that is the discussion because for so long, for over 30 years, we've been discussing about uh, climate change mm -hmm. and we've really never tackled the key issue, the key problem, fossil fuels, for example. So bringing that text of fossil fuels and phasing away from fossil fuels mm -hmm. to the COP discussion for me was very powerful, very powerful and seeing that as an outcome. And also one of the things that I, I you know, I was happy that COP I was able to achieve was the loss and damage fund uh, because you know several communities are all around the world have really suffered severe impacts of climate change and so these communities need support to adapt to the climate crisis mm. so uh, i think during cop 28 there was a discussion of like uh, we need the loss and damage fund to be paid to communities right and they needed the fund to be operational and to reach the most vulnerable communities and so at the very start of COP28, the discussion on uh, the loss and damage was finalized and money has already started flowing in to support communities. Mm -hmm. I think there was about 600 million US dollars that was put into the fund, which for us is a good start. At least we are moving to the direction that we ought to have moved a long time ago. And uh, Ugandans, are we benefiting as well? <laughs> yes, yes, because you see... <laughs> That fund is to countries that have suffered the most impacts of climate change. For example, we have people in Bududa that have yeah, suffered the yeah, landslides. Yeah. We do have people in Karamoja that have suffered famine out of uh, the climate crisis, right? So that money is supposed to reach to, out to the, the supposed stretch. to reach them, yeah. not as a compensation, but for the loss and damage that they suffered as a result of the climate crisis. Mm. Because as we know, the global north is very responsible for all the climate issues that we are currently facing. Mm. Um, for, for the, they contributed the most to the climate crisis. Let me rephrase that. So, and so they have that responsibility that people that are suffering down this side um, are suffering the most, right? So they have that responsibility to be able to support these communities. Yeah. So this money is not coming as a compensation, not as a loan, not as a grant. No, this money is like a payment to the, the impacts that they've suffered from the climate crisis. Mm. So I think all the countries that have suffered from the climate crisis are going to benefit, benefit from this from money, this. including Uganda. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you talk of the people who are suffering this. How well, or, or give us some of the ideas the advocacy ideas that you're using, how can people get involved mm -hmm. in this climate action? So one of the things that I always... Right from the grassroots, mm -hmm. yes. So one of the things that I always tell other young people is that it's very important that we understand the climate crisis, like we understand what the climate crisis is all about, you know? And from within that understanding, we're able to um, really think of solutions, you know? So um, I always say that a young person is not too young or yeah. not too young to like create change. And also you're not alone. Mm. Even a single individual can cause change. Look at, for example, we have the likes of Vanessa Nakati. They've yeah. been doing incredible work, <laughs> you know, in terms of raising awareness and also the whole advocacy thing. So I think that a young person or even a single person can make very great impact. And it all starts with really educating yourself on what the climate crisis is all about and picking up an area that you want to put focus on and you know, working on that as a young person. It's possible to create change. Yeah, definitely. it's possible. Okay, I would like also to you to specifically highlight out those ideas besides educating yourself about climate change. Mm -hmm. What are some of the ideas? Uh, Someone from the grassroots can really pick one mm -hmm. and say, let me do this and then... This can cause change. Yeah, so I could give an example of what we did while we were in Lira. We held a community clean drive, and we we're just students of Lira University that we, we came together. We we're like, well, there's a big problem of waste mismanagement in the city, uh -huh. and we need to, like, have young people go and do something. Like, yeah. um, just go and set an example 
for other people to follow, but also let people know that it's not okay to have like uh, garbage everywhere. Mm. So we organized ourselves and we went out to the city to actually clean. And that in a way like raised so much awareness. It did so much because, but like, why are these students doing this? And um, even as a person at the market, would yeah. still get to understand that they're doing this because it's a problem. And so the next time they see West, they know what to do. Mm. So as a young person, like, um, pick an area. Climate change is so broad. Yeah. You can pick a field that you want to really put your focus in, whether communi uh, uh, communicating this information to your community, translating climate change, mm. uh, maybe information to your language, for example, sharing it at church, for example. You know, asking your local pastor, can I say something about this? Because I think it's important. And talking to, for example, for, for example, the, a church is a very good place. Yeah, yeah, in a local sure. community, yeah, yeah. it's a very good place for a young person to really step out and talk to people, for example. Farmers are struggling. So I think that from within what a person does or what a person is passionate about, they can really create a change, especially in the climate field. Is, uh, you know, Climate change is affecting almost every aspect Everyone, of our lives. Yeah, yeah. So if you raise awareness about an aspect that you're interested in, then, yeah. Mm. yeah. And uh, so you talked about the schools that you've so far operated in 15 schools. Mm. Yes, how are you doing this? Do you, do you have someone behind you supporting you do this? Or mm. you're doing this as a team from university? Yes, how are you doing this? And uh, how are the schools being, uh, how are they receiving this? And then do you have any plans of also reaching out to other schools, maybe? Definitely. So with the schools, when we started the Climate Action Clubs, our plan was to make sure that it's sustainable. Like ah. it's itself, it runs by itself, by right? Itself, yeah. So, um, and I could give an example of Navisunsa and Chambago College. And um, Navisunsa, Chambago College and Kampala High, for example. The clubs are self-running. They're running by themselves. So these students meet on like a weekly basis. We give them manuals, like mm -hmm. climate change uh, tools, and then from there, they, they, they do follow the tools and then read, share with each other, oh. discuss. So um, I think also there have been opportunities for them to participate at science fairs, yeah. and where now they come up with innovation solutions to actually the climate crisis. But the schools, it operates like any club in a yeah. school. Yeah, so and then do, you, do you take time to, to visit? Yeah, with Navisunsa, I do visit a lot okay. because um, they're very young, young, yeah. young people there. And I think one of the things that I've really seen is that poetry, for example. Like there are all these sorts of projects that uh, come out of it. So I've been really visiting Navisunsa. And one of the plans that we have for this year is to organize a, uh, a national science fair mm -hmm. for these schools that mm -hmm. have climate action clubs to showcase their innovative mm -hmm. uh, solutions to the climate crisis. Yeah. And yeah. you have someone behind you supporting you do this all this work? Yeah, I would say that initially I had a colleague. I told you she's called oh, Virunja Bonita. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, and I could say, unfortunately or fortunately, she travelled abroad to study. Mm -hmm. And I do have a team of people that I work oh, with yeah. under the Climate Change Action Africa. But also, I support. I also get support from Ecosense Cities Uganda. Mm. Mm. Wow, beautiful! And uh, you gained a new role as uh, an advisory board member for the African Girls and Women for Space Robotics. Mm. Yes, take us through this. What is all about this space robotics? Mm. People need to understand what happens here. Yeah, so I could just say that my journey with your whole activism, uh, with the, with activism. Our advocacy has led me to parts that I thought I would never oh. like follow that road. I can tell you that uh, in 2023, uh, I got an opportunity to um, I present at uh, the Global Climate Conference, Global, Cli Global Space Climate Conference in Norway, mm. to the GLOC 23. And I was to present a paper on how space can play a role in climate mitigation. Okay. So I was taking on the, the case study of Uganda and how we've used uh, space observation satellites to monitor deforestation in Uganda. Mm -hmm. And I did write a paper on that and mm -hmm. I was to present okay. that. So, and from there I was uh, nominated as one of the emerging space leaders oh. from Africa. And which to me I felt like really? was really yeah. big at the time. <laughs> so um, we did attend the... the, the, the uh, International Astronomical Congress in Baku. 
And uh, I would tell you that there was so much that I learned from there. But also through my work in my work in schools, I was uh, nominated as a board member mm. for, uh, for women and girls for space robotics. Yeah. And to me, I feel like that role is really important for me because I think that space has a role to play in the climate crisis, but also because I come from a purely climate field mm. and this is a new field to me. I feel like it's really special because I can... I, I don't have to be an expert in a field to really cause change, right? Mm. And one of the things that we are planning on um, is to uh, work with schools and particularly, for example, now the climate action, yeah. th that's the plan that we had to really work with the schools to uh, empower women and girls to uh, understand how space can play a role with uh, the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And it's just capacity building. Capacity yeah, and that's building. one of the projects that I'm very excited about for this specific year. Yeah, there's yeah. someone who doesn't know space robotics. <laughs> Yeah, I know, little, I know. <laughs> a little bit more about that. How can it, how does it come into environment and climate action? Yeah, so there was this, you know, uh, space has played a role, by the way, even in understanding climate change. Okay. I could tell you that um, space satellites, for example, we have Earth observation satellites that have, have been monitoring, like, how the Earth is pattern has been changing. And also, they've been really help, helpful in, like, weather broadcasts and all these mm -hmm. aspects. So, um, for example, I could give you an example. I think in Mozambique, there was a, a cyclone there sometime. I think a cyclone or hurricane. I need to be sure of that. But there was, um, there was a, a crisis that happened out of a climate crisis that happened there. And one of the things that played a, a key role was earth observation because they're able to map out where like, the impacts were uh, where the areas that were affected the most and mm -hmm. they were able to provide like rescue missions, able to provide like these humanitarian um, humanitarian uh, services to that community. So I think that even when it comes to like, uh, when we face like the impacts of climate change, I think earth observation that is from space really mm -hmm. plays a key role in yeah. terms of like uh, supporting communities and also preparing uh, or reducing the impacts of climate change because when you're able to predict that this is support, it's going to happen, yeah. then you're able to yeah, like save it, lives yeah. and like reduce some of the worst impacts that would have yeah. affected that community. Mm. So I think space really has a, a, a key role to play. And one of the things that um, in the, 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 the event that we attended in Baku, the uh, International Astronomy Congress in Baku, uh, I think the, the theme was give space a chance. You know, give yeah. space a chance because yeah. space can do something. Okay. I think when it comes to the climate crisis, we are at a point where we need to look at all angles. We need to is, get yeah. solutions <laughs> from every corner because, you know, as a young person, knowing that the earth, like the world is like, you know, the climate crisis is only going to get worse. You're just thinking, what can we do to stop this problem that mm. is coming, uh, that we're already facing, you know? So... Uh, yeah, I think space has a key issue. Okay. Really, space does have a key issue, a key role in reducing the impacts of climate change, but also in helping us understand the climate crisis mm. and planning. Yeah. Wow. And uh, through the conversation, you, you're mentioning a lot of opportunities. Your activism has got you to. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you personally? Some of the things that have got you where to where you are, mm -hmm. yes, some of the work ethics that have really kept you to, you know, getting so much out of your activism. Yeah, I think for me it's um, what got me started. Like, you know, the, 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 my first inspiration, what really inspired me to start the journey. Because I can tell you, many times I have felt like uh, like the work is too much, like I know not, I'm like running mm. after something that mm. is too big, too yeah. like it's so hard to like, you know, you someone would I would I sometimes feel overwhelmed, especially with the work that I do. But one of the things that keeps me going is the thought of like, why did I start this? You know? And and I think about like how the problem is, you know, even becoming worse. Mm. And I think about all the young people that need to be aware and all the young people. And I've seen the power of innovation among young people. So one thing that always keeps me going is like, I know there's a solution. Yeah. I know there's a solution somewhere. And I know that through collective, if we come together all, all over the world, we're able to solve this problem. Mm. So I think that's the thing that keeps me going, keeps me pushing. And also I could tell you that I really work hard. Um, 
I really put in like effort to like really understand like what is how can I contribute here, you mm -hmm. know? And then also I could say I, I could collaborate with so many young people, and most importantly, I believe in God. I believe that always God guides my path in mm -hmm. everything that I do. Wow. So I think those are some of the aspects that have really, really pushed me and that, that have really, really kept me going. Mm -hmm. That's far, yeah. Yes, and where do you see, what are your future plans with your advocacy work? So one of the things that I really want to uh, continue doing is to continue raising awareness. My uh, hope is that in my hope is that in the next uh, few years we have expanded like the climate action clubs to s several schools in the country mm. and also because i know that that is very helpful for schools to you know understand the climate crisis and also we would also love to like make the science fair a big thing and we would also want to be able to support projects to maturity level and um, and also i think for me the key thing is like really bringing young people. Mm -hmm. I really want to achieve it. I want to bring young people to young the discussion. People. I want to be able to um, like, you know, promote innovation in Africa. Because normally in Africa, we, especially with the technologies I'm working yeah. with, you know, um, the climate altering technologies, this is something that's really new. Very little research has been done and it's such a risky technology. And so for me, I feel like it's a very big opportunity for Africa to really be involved from the start. Mm. And and also throughout this year, I'll really be de de dedicating my work to that because we are planning a, a side event at UNEA 6, that is the United Nations Environment Assembly in Nairobi. It's going mm. to be from the 26th to the 1st of March. Mm -hmm. And we're really planning on like, how can we structure an event for young people? You know, how can we bring these young people and like, you know, mm. build their capacity on this topic and get to get the insights on what they think this should be, you know. And then together with them, we, we grow, uh, you know, an initiative and, you know, raise awareness all across the continent. Um, so as to what I really want to achieve this year, I want to really work with young people in terms of, you know, finding solutions to the climate change crisis and, you know, supporting communities as, you yeah. know, young people, yeah. yeah. And then I'll bring this in, <laughs> uh, particularly Uganda. What do you think the government can do? Or how far can the government do to see this climate action moving to the grassroots people? So I think the government is already doing a lot. Okay. I can tell you. Um, if you see the, uh, the work that the ministry is doing, I think most of the time people are not aware about the things, you know. But they're doing very incredible work. Um, down in the grassroots and I think like I would I just give you an example of the capacity building program that we had it was mm. a whole two-day program they dedicated that the, the, the whole time to really really making sure that we understand uh, the key issues in the climate field but also empower us to really be able to negotiate like at the international level mm. and also at the grassroots they're really doing work in terms of building resilience for communities mm. they have several projects that they're using to um, support communities mm. So, and I think one of the things that the government of Uganda is really focusing on is adaptation. How can communities adapt to the climate crisis? We have the situation of Karamoja, for example. I know that there's an irrigation uh, scheme, there's a big irrigation project that is being conducted in Karamoja. And I think that is, and you've seen, for example, in Bududa, we had the landslides in Bududa, yeah. Bududa right? And the, there's this whole, um, uh, they are, can I say, they are um, re like they are providing like a new place for people to move into, for lack of a better word. So, but, but, but then you see these people are also I don't know people are reluctant mm -mm, to to you move know, to to move. Mm. Yeah. So that's a whole thing, you know, and like it, it's it's the, all these aspects and you know. But you can see the government is doing something. Yeah. I've also seen that they're also <laughs> limiting the cutting of trees for charcoal. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a license, mm -hmm. also carrying charcoal. Mm. to Kampala, mm. you're stopped. True. Yes, and then people are also given punishments, imprisoned. Mm. But then what are some of the alternatives that we can use as Ugandans, as the local person who cannot afford, you know? Mm. We use charcoal for cooking. Mm. So what are some of the alternatives that these people can adapt to to see that we reduce this cutting of trees for yeah. charcoal? So, of course, like, I, I've seen several projects on charcoal briquettes, I think, and I think that's a very good alternative for, for uh, burning f yeah. uh, fuel. And, you know, I think it starts from people being aware. 
and mm. you know some people are cutting trees yeah. and they they, they, they know they're know. surviving <laughs> you know mm. and i think also yeah so that's the thing um it's very important like uh, for people first to be aware yeah and then um uh, yeah you can ask people to innovate or to even think of what they can do what alternatives do they have mm. charcoal briquettes for now is a really better yeah. option for several people yeah it goes yeah. back to awareness mm, awareness yeah. awareness is very important it's very really key. really important <laughs> not, by, uh, not only awareness because there's always a notion of like saying well awareness people are aware limited people can be aware and do nothing about it True. So it's awareness and capacity building, yeah. but it even goes beyond that to empowering the people to really be able to change. Mm. So there are several factors that are in there that really um, yeah, need to be looked at when you're mm. raising awareness or even building yeah. capacity. Yeah. And then what are some of the challenges, some of the things that put you down with the work that you're doing? Do you face any challenges? Yeah. Definitely. Moments that you feel like, oh, this work is really too much for me. Well, yeah, I could tell you that... Uh, <clears throat> Like, um, you know, there's always a debate of like, there's always something that comes up in the club, I feel like, there's eco-anxiety. And I can tell you that eco-anxiety eco, eco is true. It's something, I come from a psychology, I'm a psychologist by mm. profession. Mm. Although I'm in the climate field <laughs> and I'm in all these, these different areas. Yeah. And I can tell you that uh, this whole, like, fear for the future of where we are headed to is real yeah um, and also that thing like young people really need to be aware of like where we are headed yeah. to and really need to understand like the depth of the climate crisis because mm. if we tell you we're hitting 1.5 degrees by 2050 but we are most likely to hit uh, 1.5 degrees increase in temperature by 2050 mm. and what that really means for what it is right it's really scary it's a very scary future so I think the thing is like I'm always very scared of like mm. where we are headed to, but also I think one of the things that has that has that always like makes me feel sad is when like um, when like like for example you go like you attend for example climate conferences and you see that leaders are taking another direction yeah. when we should be heading this direction. I think that is very demotivating for young people to see, and it's very it's just very demotivating for young people. And I could just say that, and communities are suffering. Like we've seen people really suffering very from good. the climate crisis. Mm. Some people feel like the climate crisis is so far off. Like it's something that's going to happen in the future. <laughs> it's not happening. Yet we are living it yes. now. Yes, and so the problem is some people do not even know that they're suffering. Some of uh, climate, the climate issues out of, uh, and even sometimes all these, like the climate issues can affect like their economy, how they live their lives, their health and all these aspects. And some people do not really understand, they do even know that this is as a result of climate change, for mm. example. So, yeah, you know, attending these climate yeah. conferences, like for me going there and like hearing that leaders are really not, for example, I told you the example of like they've been negotiating for 30 years now. And they've really never brought, you know, really focused on the key yeah. issue, fossil fuels. We mm. have a problem with fossil fuels, mm. you know, and fossil fuels still continue to be, you know, exploited or extracted by organizations. The big projects that are ongoing, you know, so to know that, to all understand that we have this problem and we know that to solve this problem, we need to move away from fossil fuels. Mm. And you see instead leaders moving towards fossil fuels. I think that's very disheartening, especially yeah. for communities like yeah. our own yeah. that is really, that are already suffering the impacts mm. of climate change. Oh. So for me, in the advocacy journey, I think that is one of the demoralizing things, the things that really make me feel sad. Mm. Yeah. But, but you're doing amazing work and oh, keep thank moving. You. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. as we come to the end of the conversation, what are your lessons for the young people, most especially to the young girls, the ladies and the women? Um, I think the lessons that I have for young people is that, um, like I said earlier, never think that you're too young yeah. to create impact. I don't also think that you're alone and you alone cannot create impact. It's very possible. Believe in yourself. Believe that you can do it. Have faith in yourself mm -hmm. and set out to uh, do something. Ask for advice. The people yeah. that have already walked that path. And let me tell you, it's so surprising how people are willing to support. Like throughout my journey, I have got incredible people that have really you. sat me down and told yeah. me, hey, look, you're saying this, but 
this is not the case. Like, it's not scientifically backed, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, people that are really, 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 like, questioned what I thought before, right? And they've grown with me, the people that have provided guidance to me, mm -hmm. the people that have showed, showed opportunities to me, the people out there that are willing to support. Just set out there, believe in yourself. Ask questions, get people to support you. It's yeah. very possible to achieve. I think whatever you are, whatever you're doing, how, whatever age you're at, I think that it's really, really possible to achieve change. Wow. Yeah. And then uh, your, your last remarks, uh, what you think our viewers cannot go away without, you know, hearing from you, your last remarks about your work, mm. what you think people should know about your work as we come to the end of the conversation. Thank you so much. So about like what I really think people shouldn't go without knowing about, I think it's very important that I talk about the new climate altering technologies. And uh, so, like I mentioned Ali, we are most like the IPCC, uh, the, IPC, the report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, mm -hmm. the six assessment report, it clearly stated that we are more likely than not to hit 1.5 degrees. And that is a very scary feature for us. And, um, and so, you know, scientists are coming up with all these projects. What can we do to solve, uh, that when, what can we do in a situation of overshoot when we, we, we overshoot the climate crisis? And they're proposing this new technology is called the, climate, the new climate altering technologies. And these technologies are not to be like implemented or not to be like deployed as, a, as like a standalone solution, no. It's supposed to accompany the deep mitigation uh, efforts, that is like real reduction of fossil fuels, mm. and then also it's supposed to help with also adaptation. So there's adaptation, there's mitigation of the climate crisis, and then there's this new additional approach that scientists are now researching about. Mm. So it's a whole set of techn techniques or technologies that are supposed to help. So I could tell you that there's one called marine cloud brightening. This is like supposed to help with the um, like countries that are near, maybe water bodies, for example. So they're supposed to inject, if the project is basically suggest injecting sea salt particles to the clouds right above the water body. So that is supposed to protect like the ecosystem underwater and like stop the temperatures uh, of water from rising, right? And it's supposed to protect the coral reefs. It's a project that's currently being implemented in Australia mm. and to protect the Great Barrier Reef. And then uh, there is, um, Marie, uh, these circus cloud thinning, they want to reduce the thickness of circus clouds because they have a tendency of trapping heat. And then there are all the scientific uh, approaches. There are about six approaches. But the one I want to talk about is called the stratospheric aerosol injection. So the stratospheric aerosol injection is simply just means that um, it's a technique that aims at, achieve, at reducing or increasing the Earth's reflectability. The idea is can we inject a uh, a very reflective particle above the earth's surface. Okay. So as to, you know how we, in science, we know like, um, we know that uh, uh, bright surfaces reflect sunlight, right? Mm. And you know with the climate crisis, they say that the, the sun hits the earth and because yeah. of the greenhouse gases, the heat is being trapped in the yeah. earth's surface, right? So scientists are thinking, how, what can we do to reduce the amount of sun radiation that reaches the earth, right? So mm. that we're able to temporarily uh, limit warming as we think as we increase maybe mitigation or adaptation efforts, right? So the stratospheric aerosol injection for it, it just aims at putting sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide, because sulfur dioxide is a very highly reflective gas. So it's a very highly reflective gas. So it aims at spreading those the sulfur dioxide above the earth's stratosphere. So we have the atmosphere, we have all these layers of the earth, mm. and then the stratosphere is about ten thousand feet above the earth. So it's like getting big planes and injecting sulfur dioxide. So why they came up with the whole idea of sulfur dioxide was because of, I think there was, um, in 1991, there was a very gigantic volcanic eruption in the Philippines, in uh, Mount Penachubo, mm. and it was so huge that uh, scientists observed that in the next two years, the average global temperature reduced. So they were trying to investigate that, why is it that it reduced, you know? and then they found links back to the volcanic eruption. So when the volcanic eruption happened, there was this gas that was released into the atmosphere, and that yeah. was sulfur dioxide. And so it created that aerosol, those reflective, highly reflective gas particles above the earth's surface, 
and it was able to reflect like the sunlight for a long for those two years and it kind of reduced warming for that period so science is just one to they want to mimic that gigantic volcanic eruption but this time with injecting uh uh, sulfur dioxide with planes yeah. above the Earth's surface. Mm. But that alone is, uh, and you know, one of the things that they say is that it's, 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 it's a, it can act very fast, like in terms of reducing uh, the average global temperature, it can reduce it very fast. Mm. But the problem with it is we do not understand how that will affect us. Because yeah. that is man literally interfering with the natural system on the Earth, right? Because you're putting sulfur dioxide, this is sulfur dioxide, People say it can easily cause acid, acid rain on the earth, but we do not even understand its impact on agriculture. Because if you're talking about reducing the amount of sunlight or sun radiation that is reaching the earth, how is that going to affect agriculture? How is that going to affect health, for example? Mm -hmm. Do you understand how these aerosols are going to react with the earth's, you know, these chemicals in the earth's atmosphere, for example? Mm -hmm. And how is that going to affect our health? Yeah. And then, most importantly, who is going to make decisions? Who is going to make decisions on whether this technology should be deployed, yeah, for example? Yeah. So I think that is, you know, it presents a very big risk. There's a chance that it could help us, you know, reduce the impacts of climate change because it can act fast. It can be like a real hope for communities like ours because if we hit 1.5, we are most likely to, to really suffer. Yeah. But at the same time, we do not understand <clears throat> what if it brings a bigger risk so there's this whole notion of like the risk-risk paradigm. Like we need to understand the risk of deploying these technologies mm -hmm. and the risk of not deploying these technologies and see which one way is better. But also the discussion of whether this is something we should do because some people say that this could easily lead us to, uh, it could easily, like companies that are, you know, into fossil fuel production will say, well, we have a solution. And so they will not reduce the amount of fossil fuels that they're producing. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, and that, in a way, could like hamper like the climate action. So there's this whole debate of like, should we even research them? Should we even be out there researching these yeah. technologies? Mm -hmm. And most importantly, who even makes decisions? Yeah. Who is regulating this tech? Who is re regulating the research of these technologies? And who is going to regulate the deployment of these technologies? So, and that's the work that I do. I, you know, raise awareness, tell young people there are these technologies that are happening and we young people need to have a say. We need to come into the discussion and really, really be yeah. strong from the very start that this is what we want. Uh, whether we want, do we want these technologies? Is this something that we want for ourselves? Because mm -hmm. in the future, we the young people yeah, are the ones to, to deal with, with the impacts. If yeah. it's deployed, we are the ones to suffer with it. If it's not deployed, we are still the, the ones, ones to yeah. suffer from the climate <laughs> yeah. crisis. So, like regardless of anything, we young people just have to enter the discussion and really understand what these technologies are bringing on the table mm. and also like make sure that we are there from the very start and that we don't come in later when the research is already happening and, and we don't know where to start in, from, yeah. you know, as young people. So it's very important that we come to, to the discussion now. right now and we talk about these technologies mm. early enough. And then for someone to join the activism, <laughs> the climate, the advocacy that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, well, is it okay for someone to look for you to join your yes. advocacy work? Yes, actually. And not only looking for me, I think there's so many initiatives in the country that are like, uh, that are raising awareness and even doing real work in the communities. Mm. So I think that from within where you are, you can identify an, an initiative or a project, whether it be, it be government, whether it be a youth-led organization, whether it be an NGO, because several NGOs right now are doing climate work mm. and get involved, yeah. really get involved because, you know, this is our future that we're yeah. talking about here. True. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Sarah, for coming through. Mm, thank you so mm. much for having me today. <laughs> yeah, we hope to see more of these conversations, not only with you, but uh, with many, many youths, as she said, it's your time now to get involved in all this because you are the one to suffer the consequences that will come after on. Yes, uh, it has been so wonderful having Sarah on the panel. And uh, yes, she has talked about something that we really need to involve ourselves in and really uh, consider so important in our lives because it affects everyone. And uh, climate action starts with you with your neighborhood from where you are you can do something to cause change i've been your host margin thank you to the people on the cameras thank you so much for everyone 
who was tuned in in this particular episode. Hope to see you next time. Bye.